Welcome, everybody. We're going to be discussing gender perspectives in detective fiction. And we are, from the end... I'm S.G. Wonk. Axel Howerton. Janice McDonald. Wayne Arthurson. And we write detective fiction. <laughs> Pa-da-da. bum 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 now, there's a lot of ways we could go about doing this, but uh, maybe what we should do is just uh, everybody pick your first lane in terms of what interests you about the, the topic. Okay. Um, what interests me about this topic, which is, I feel stumped now, and it's ironic because I had suggested this panel. <laughs> But that was a long time ago. I think I find that reading detective fiction, I found a lot of tropes and there's, you know, a formulaic, there can be a formulaic aspect to it. <clears throat> and then I'm a fan of hardball detective fiction from the 30s, the pulp fiction kind of stuff, like in Black Mask magazine from the 30s. And... Um, I found that for me, translating that into what I write, which is um, a version of 1930s hardball detective fiction, but I have a female PI as a protagonist, I, I'm really interested in how to translate that to a modern reader sensibility, with, but at the same time doing justice to, to the tradition. So does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, my book is also a modernization. Um, kind of a, both an homage and a subversion of those same tropes. Um, what really interested me was the idea of somebody with that kind of male nobility that was really a stereotype in, say, 30s and 40s uh, hard-boiled fiction and films and having a modern... Um, protagonist have those values and have those character traits while surrounded by characters that were definitely taken straight out of today. And um, I just kind of worked around that premise and so was born my, my book. In my series, I think I, what I like to play with is playing against what I see as a stereotype. So I, I have a female detective, which is not incredibly unusual, although they didn't really start showing up thick on the ground until the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, very strong female friendships happening throughout the series, and I have a goodly lot of uh, uh, old lady killers, you know, to <laughs> when it comes right down to it. So I'm, I'm your equal opportunities, <laughs> mystery writer. Yeah. I guess I didn't have a direct thing. I want to talk about gender perspectives in detective fiction. Um, my character, Leo, is somewhat amoral. And I wanted to create uh, a character that was somewhat amoral that people would cheer about. Um, I guess the main gender perspective in my first novel um, is the victim. A lot of, a lot of, and there's a sort of serial killer thing. A lot of serial killers start with a female victim. And first, I was kind of against that, but since my novels are uh, delve in uh, native um, social justice issues, uh, a lot of native women are killed, especially prostitutes, and these things aren't investigated. So I wanted that to be part of the first novel, of the issue of missing women um, and that coming up. Although in just starting the novel, that was not what my plan was. I wasn't there to make a point. I just had a great character. I had a, obviously it was male because uh, it's easier for me to write from a male perspective because I am a guy. Um, and but the secondary characters, I had a lot of interesting dealings with. And which one shall I make female? Which one shall I not make female? And I can talk about that later and see how that would work. So. One of the things that they say about detective fiction is that because there is so much demand for detective fiction and the readers of detective fiction are such addicts, uh, a lot of elements of social, uh, the, the social barriers get pushed a lot quicker in detective fiction than they do in mainstream fiction. So you have uh, 
uh, Native American characters in Tony Hillerman's novels before you have them in mainstream literature as much. You have uh, uh, homosexual detectives before you have a very mainstream homosexual literature. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you feel that you can do things with the gender roles that you would feel a little more constricted by if you weren't working within a formulaic genre. I think what's interesting about what I've uh, personally observed and, and some online reading about mystery readers is um, I think all mystery readers know the formula. So they're not looking for a new formula, but I think they're looking for something that will catch their interest within the confines of that. And of course, if there's the, even the twist is a formulaic element, but um, they'll, they'll enjoy that. I think readers are equal opportunity in, in terms of their taste for the killers, for the protagonists, for whatever the cast of characters. As, I think as long as they're interesting for readers, uh, my sense is no one cares what gender they are. Um, maybe people care when stereotypes show up. You know, that that's when there's uh, controversy or, or there's, you know, some uproar, upset. It's the stereotype that's the problem, not so much the, the gender of the characters, whether the, the, the killer is the butler or the maid or... <laughs> Love that formula. Uh, I just had, like, um, was it Murder by Death pop into my head? <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, there. I'll end my answer there. <laughs> uh, I definitely found it easier because that hierarchy is kind of already there where people expect the characters are going to fit those molds. That it was that much easier to, again, subvert that and in the characterization make it something new that people maybe weren't expecting. I, I have homosexual characters and I have um, you know, the good woman character instead of being kind of the carpet for the, the, the PI and like it would have been, I made her more of a strong character that goes against what you would normally expect. And I, I found it was easier to do that um, in the framework of, like you say, a formulaic genre like detective fiction that it is to do in just literary fiction. Because then you have to not only establish the characters in their hierarchy, but then you have to feed that characterization into it. And that's much harder to do when you're already having to build the whole framework. When I was thinking of the name of my character, one of the things I'd come across when I was studying detective fiction is that if you have a female character, well, if you name a character, the, a lot of names in detective fiction tend to be symbolic. So if you want to make the character's name symbolic, that's fine. But if you don't, you better make sure you don't do it inadvertently. You know, because your reader is, you know, subtextually looking for it. So uh, one of the things that happens with a lot of female characters is they have androgynous names or they go by initials or they... And the rationale for that is pretty self-evident. You can... Uh, they can be mistaken. Somebody's going off to meet Sam Adams and Sam can sit there and get the lay of the land before they find out they're meeting a girl instead of a boy. Or uh, they, can, they can do a job that might not be suitable for a woman. Or they could be seen to be more like tomboys. You know, if you've got a, um, a, a boyish sounding name, chances are people are going to think, well, they can take care of themselves a little better. They're probably more rough and tumble. So I thought, well, I'll name my character Randy because that's a good androgynous name, and uh, <laughs> which is awful because then I married a Randy, which is a very good masculine name. <laughs> but, but my Randy was a Miranda. And Miranda, of course, the most famous Miranda is the, the lovely, naive Miranda from The Tempest. So the concept of being working against type of, of being the naive person and be, but she's definitely not a tomboy. My Miranda it has her head firmly in the clouds, and she, everything she she 
she filters everything through either literature or musical theater song lyrics. So her concept of reality is a little bit twisted. So it's, it's so not being a tomboy that that's my kind of twist on things, mm -hmm. that she has the tomboy's name, but she doesn't act according to what you would assume would be type. I don't, go, when I'm writing my fiction, especially my crime stuff, I don't go in, I don't, not a, I don't know a lot about crime fiction. I read some of it. So I'm not going like, like you people are great and you know a lot about stuff. I'm not yeah. going like, I'm going, I'm going to go against this and go against that. I'm just, I have a character and I'm very intuitive in my writing. I'm going to see what happens and try to get him into trouble. Um, and the, the thing about gender, my, in, in, like I talked about the, uh, the, 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 the victim, but the thing I have with gender in my novels with the secondary characters in the newspaper, because Leo is a journalist and he's in the newspaper and I had issues like I had, he had a desk buddy who sleeps the cost of him and in, the fir in my first draft the desk buddy was female and the immediate boss was male and when I went I know people newspapers and you know, that's actually different a lot of the media bosses city editors are female so I'm just going to switch them and it seemed to work at that time and it seems to work because then in the second book the, the, him and his immediate supervisor started a relationship which seemed to work so for me I don't go thinking I have to do this because I need to reach the gender thing or make sure I just go and see what works for me even especially with the even racial stuff or other things like that, it just seemed to work to, to switch this character. And and the funny thing is, I'm adapting my novel into a TV thing just to see what I can do with it. And there's a managing editor in the in the books who is a very strong male, swears a lot, and yells at people. And oddly enough, it's based on Catherine Ford, in Calgary Herald. So in the TV <laughs> thing, the, so in the TV thing, I'm going like, well. I'm listening to Gina Davis going, I can switch this to a female, so I can create more parts for female actresses. So I guess, it was, I guess in the newspaper business, it seemed easier to move things like that, but still not lose the essence of the character. And then it changes, how do I think about this character? She has these issues with that. And you know, he's got a wife and two kids now. And we'll move that. And so it, it just, for me, it, it's organic in how I create things and how I choose which characters are going to be. Well, riffing on that, do you think your protagonist could just as easily be of the other sex? No. Why not? No, you don't get away with just a no. <laughs> <laughs> you asked a yes, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I don't know if, if everyone here has somehow got the impression that, you know, I have a checklist and that's how I write because that's not how I write. Um, my characters really come to me the way that they are. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, they, she came as a she to me. You know, Lola. Lola Stark is the name of my protagonist. Um, and Lola was just Lola. She came as a woman. Um, her baggage, her family baggage, it could be a, a man's baggage or a woman's baggage. Uh, but it's Lola's baggage. Um, her best friend is a woman. It could easily have been, her best friend could have been, I, Lola was just always a woman to me. Um, and it just, because I wanted to play around with that, you know, that um, male PI trope. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to play around with that. And the way that I'm doing it, I think, it, it can't be done with, with her being a man. Okay. You know, so there are instances in the books where people refer to her being a woman doing that profession um, a, as a private investigator. And, uh, yeah, and the cops refer to the fact that she's a woman. And I think that's interesting t for me to write. And uh, so, no, that's why no. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, I actually had toyed with that initially with making the detective a female as a way to, again, subvert those expectations. But um, the kind of backstory that I came up with, there's a lot of inheritance issues that 
kind of are inherently masculine. You know, he has a uh, he's kind of inherited this role from his grandfather, who was a you know famous L.A. dick in the '30s. So it would it, it seemed a little harder to translate that from a from a you know grandfather from the '30s to a 30 year old woman today. And so I tried to kind of do that gender swapping and um, change up the, the sexual dynamics of some of the characters in the secondary characters. And I, I think it worked pretty well. But. My character changes jobs with every book. And I think... I really wanted her to be likable. I wanted her to be somebody that the reader would immediately identify with because the whole concept of the books is to throw you into an entirely different segment of the world each time. So if you're having to fight with the character, that's just too much. So uh, in order to be likable and yet to be believable in all this switching of jobs, I think there's something a little flaky about the fact that she switches jobs so much, which you find possibly endearing in a single woman, and you would find a little problematic in a grown man, you know, and I know that sounds sexist, but there's a, in the same way as you say, you you need to have that, oh, interesting for a woman Mm -hmm. to do this, I think there's... uh, the shorthand of being able to say, okay, well, that's just the way she is, and it's not like she has to feed another mouth, but et cetera, et cetera, uh, is, makes it a lot easier to run her as a woman. Um, yeah, I think I go from that perspective. Um, my books are in first person, and I think I have a lot of other issues he's dealing with that I don't think I have the talent or the skill to have it as a female character. Um, it's, it's a totally different mindset um, that I don't think I could understand. And also there's a physicality of being a woman that I will not able to understand. So that's why Leo is a man because it's easier for me to get into his head and talk the way he talks and thinks the way he thinks. Um, maybe someone could see him as a woman in a, in a, in a theatrical thing Um, because you don't get into his head but because you know women can be just as amoral as men but for me it's just the ease of writing in order to get certain things across I have to make it easy like a shorthand make it easier for me to I don't have to worry about uh, sorry he's going through his period this time you know I I don't have to figure out how that feels that kind of stuff I just have to focus on Leo doing stuff that guys do and he's got to pee he's going to stand against the wall and pee and that's the thing. So it's easier for me to do that than it is to go the other way. And so as a writer, for you, it just makes more sense to, make, to have Leo be a man. For the story, would it made a, have made a difference if, if she, it, it, he had been a she? Uh, it, possibly it could have been different. Um, I like to go with the, you know, maybe Leo wouldn't have left his kids if he was a woman, but, you know, women have left their kids too, so it's another thing going that way. Um, uh, Woody had more invested into this, uh, into the, into the, the um, investigation of the prostitute if he was a woman, uh, possibly, but, and, but I also think how he'd be treated as a woman, especially one who's partly Native, might have come into a role, especially when he's dealing with some of the Native culture in the book. So that's part of that. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 he, it could work, but it would have changed the whole story. Mm-hmm. It would have been really hard, more harder for me to do. And I'm inherently lazy. And <laughs> I want things to be, you know, the faster I get this book done, the better it is. Because, and I want to get it done so it's, I can go to the next one. So I didn't want to make it hard on my, harder on myself than it already was. Yeah. So if we've looked at the, the issues of, the characterization. What about actual gender issues within the plots? Uh, did you know? Have you wrestled with a gender issue in your in any of the plots? And you know, if so, what and why? 
I think that um, I was just thinking about the the second book, um, and there are gender issues, but they're tied so closely with cultural issues, issues of culture, that I really I never I never separated it out as a gender issue. Uh, so in particular, the world that I've created in my books, um, Chinese is a dominant culture for a, a alternate history 1930s LA type city. So um, yeah, all the gender issues in this book that I'm thinking of, uh, they have to, they're tied in with culture, you know. So um, that's been, yeah, that's where that goes for me. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat there. There are there are some issues, um, uh, spousal abuse and, and rape in very small amounts uh, in my book, but they're kind of tied to generational um, thoughts on that, and it's things that happened in the 30s. And, um, you know, again, one of the tropes is the, the strong woman, and I had the woman that this happens to in the 30s take that and turn it into a means to take control of her life and become powerful and influential and you know that was a choice I guess yeah. but so f and just yeah generational exactly so f in, in this book that I'm referred to the second book you know the gender issue arises I guess from a an older Chinese woman's idea of what uh, a Chinese woman should be how she should act how she should, um, what she should do for her family, what she should do for her brothers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the gender issue that comes, uh, that comes up, yeah. I have those too. <laughs> of course you do. I think the strongest gender issue that I've dealt with comes in Sticks and Stones, which is a book dealing with uh, poison pen letters sent from a boy's dorm to a girl's dorm at the university and uh, tied in around uh, a, a, a tribute to the Montreal Massacre at the same time. So a lot of the ideas of who's allowed to be educated and who's allowed to feel free at university and uh, uh, is underpinning what is actually a book about culpability, you know, who's to blame for letting issues get as far as they do, but, but that's very much uh, tied into things, and it's also tied into Twelfth Night, so you know, <laughs> uh, poor old Randy never thinks of things only one directionally. Um, obviously, as I said, my first book is about a native prostitute who's murdered, and nobody investigates it, and that's obviously a huge gender issue, which is it uh, plays a huge role in my in the first book, and uh, and that was part of one reason why I was writing the book and to get that out, and why I chose a female victim. Uh, in the second book, I said, "Well, I I wanted to have a male victim, just to be fair," um, <laughs> and but also it was also someone Leo knew from his time as a street person, and as a street person, he probably wouldn't hang out with a lot of female women. He would hang out with a lot of males, and so it was a young native male and doing my research and my knowledge of that, it's like, how do young street person, male street persons die, other through suicide, violence, or drugs? I chose violence. Um, and so, and why would they, why would they die? So that also plays a role in also, because it has to deal with gangs and how gangs use young native males uh, for their purposes to make money and for power. So um, I wanted to do that as well. And again, this is all instinctive. I'm not going like, okay, I've got to write that book about gangs now and do this sociological experiment. It's just where Leo goes and takes me and how it follows. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it does play a role. And the third book, which isn't out yet, um, again, the victim is male, but the fact that he's male isn't as big of a deal. It's partly a bit, but I don't think it's as big of a deal. Um, yeah. Okay, segue. <laughs> uh, Dorothy L. Sayers created Lord Peter Whimsey, and then, of course, when she created Harriet Vane, she suddenly had to create a much more realistic Lord Peter Whimsey for Harriet Vane to fall in love with. And 
the, eventually she wrote Busman's Honeymoon, which has a subtitle of a romance with mystery overtones. And if you, you know, true mystery uh, formula, you, you, you keep the romance off to the side. You, you know, it's not something, you know, we don't get all Daphne du Maurier or Mary Stewart on you. Uh, so it's, it's good and uh, uh, it's, it, it's very subdued. But <laughs> I promised Wayne we'd talk about sex. Sex. So <laughs> let's and talk about this. everyone. Oh, everyone just went, perked up. <laughs> so let's talk about sexual tension in the mystery novels and how do you deal with it and how far do you feel it goes without snapping the formula or endangering your plot or enhancing your plot? I'm going to let Axel go first. <laughs> There is a lot of sex in my book. <laughs> Done. <laughs> it's for sale in the lobby. Um, luckily for me, uh, detective fiction doesn't necessarily have to mean mystery per se. My book is not really terribly mysterious. Um, it is hard-boiled detective fiction. And uh, so I kind of had free reign to explore the romantic end of it and sexual relationships. Like I say, I have um, characters in there that are actually uh, they're homosexual sex performers by night and hired thugs by day. And awesome. they're really they're they're kind of a screwball comedy uh, couple, just kind of dropped in the middle of the rest of this they're, stuff. They're great. <laughs> and uh, so there's you know some little exchanges between them. But the, the major um, relationship between the detective and the daughter of his client um, kind of comes from, from the desperation of them both to, to find somebody. And I use that kind of in a romance, um, probably kind of a cliche. But, um, and I use that to add that little bit of pepper because, you know, everybody wants a little zing in the book. But... Um, I also used it to try and explore more about relationships and more about, again, those tropes that come from those 30s pulp books where, you know, detective meets the woman and she's swooning in five minutes and they're, you know, going to get married and move off and, well, yeah, you're, you're going to jail for 40 years, but I'll wait for you, you know, like Sam Spade, so... Um, yeah, I think like everything else, it's a, it, it's always an opportunity to explore those subtexts, but um, keeping away from the actual mystery, I didn't have to worry about it really bending too far or breaking any of the formula. Hmm. But that's me. <laughs> I think that, I think probably most writers will use that as another way to demonstrate some aspect of their character's uh, um, personality or character, lack of a better word. And um, I don't, I had a really good point, but I was so enthralled by what you're saying, Axel. It's escaped me now. I think that um, beyond that, oh yes, because in Hard Boiled, there are, there are tropes, there are archetypes, as we discussed on Friday night. Um, it's interesting to use sex now with the modern reader's sensibility in mind to, to either twist those archetypes or have fun with them, um, have fun with the formula, and um, hopefully that's fun for, for me as a writer and fun for the readers as well. Um, you know, so for my character, for Lola, she has a really blasé attitude towards sex. You know, it is what it is. And, and in that world, it's really not a big deal. Um, it's just another thing that people do or don't do at certain times and other times. And it's not used as a weapon to marginalize people. Yeah, so in the first book, um, and it's a bit of a spoiler. <laughs> But one of the characters is gay. And um, it's not a big social stigma at all, but it does come as a surprise to certain other characters. Yeah. 
Well, Randy has a boyfriend who's a cop. And one of the tensions... They have a happens. lot of sex. <laughs> yeah. They close the door, though. They sure do. Does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but one of the tensions, of course, is that he cannot discuss the case. You know, the, so there's this constant tension between uh, you know more than I do, or you may be uh, you may be playing me for information here, or you you have information that it would be so beneficial for my friend to have or something like that. Uh, so that to me is the big tension. Although in Hang Down Your Head, along came this amazing other character and <laughs> all these, uh, a bunch of readers said, oh, isn't Steve jealous? <laughs> and I'm going, you know, hey, who do you think Steve really is here? But Woody was this, this fabulous, you know, blow into town, uh, pro from Dover type. And, uh, uh, and everybody took him in stride, including my editor. She just, I think she had a big crush on Woody, actually. Uh, but in the latest book, Steve is on a trip. He's on a, a professional junket. And there is a female uh, detective who has come into the, the group that Randy didn't really know was as good looking as she turns out to be. But uh, so she's showing a few elements of, of jealousy because she's got the sense that this new detective has uh, her cap set for Steve. And my editor was very awkward about that she, uh, because she said, Randy wouldn't be jealous. Randy is so together and Randy is wonderful. I'm going, <laughs> which Randy are you reading about? <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, you know, but, because you know, I think she, some other people's vision of Randy as being really, really together and cool <laughs> and I want to be her best friend is not really... Uh, you know, they can't allow her to be frail or, you know, to have foibles. And uh, so the jealousy I, I had to fight for. I, I had to say, you know, just because she's never been jealous before, she may never have had need to be jealous. But, you know, she's, she's reacting in a natural way for her at the moment. Mm -hmm. And in a certain level, that could also reflect, you know, the depth of her feeling, right, for yeah. Steve. Yeah. That's how I read it. Um, in the first book, Leo doesn't have any relationship because he's not ready for it. He's still coming off the streets to figure out his position. In the second book, he's figuring out his life and he's got an apartment now, a real one. So he's starting to get relationship with his, it's not a big spoiler, with his um, immediate supervisor. And it just seemed natural to work that way because they're both troubled individuals and they don't really socialize that well. And these are the only people they have they can connect with. It happens a lot in newspapers. Because his, his male deskmate, his wife, is also a reporter at the paper. It's a very incestuous thing at the journalists. Um, the funny thing is, um, I knew they were going to have sex, but I could not write the sex scene. I was not going to write the sex scene because I did not want to be ridiculed. I mean, I, I would, I would I, you know, I can write a scene where the guy's getting the crap beat out of him and I actually choreographed those and he's going to throw them <laughs> he's going to go <clears throat> and, and just so I get it right but the sex I was not going to choreograph that because then because <laughs> then I would be going from my own thoughts going well I don't want myself to look bad and I don't want to make Leo seem great because you know Leo hasn't had sex for over two years you know the first time is not going to be <laughs> Great. Long. Um, so I, and, and I've discussed it with other writers, crime writers, going like, yeah, I can show violence easily and work it and think about it and how's it going to work and blah, blah, blah. Ooh, sex. I don't know. I don't wanna, <laughs> you know, some people do it quite well, but, you know, if you do it badly, it looks yeah. terrible. So I did not, they shut the door <laughs> and that's all we see. They don't even shut the door. Like, they don't even get up to go to the bed, to bedroom. They're just sitting here having coffee in his apartment. And then the next day, they're smiling at each other at work and making little eyes. And nobody... Time and, passes. Yes. And time passes. So that's an interesting concept of actually writing... Is it easier to write violence for crime writers or is it easier to write love? <laughs> and... Yeah. Yeah, I guess. 
That, that's why male writers, when they write sex scenes, the male protagonist is always the greatest lover that's ever lived. <laughs> We don't, want it to reflect, we don't want it to reflect badly. <laughs> so, uh, and we do choreograph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With, um, remember Archie Goodwin, Rex Dow, Meryl Wolf. They started off, he was sort of the, the sexy ladies' man, but he ended up being a romantic relationship, and you know, Rex Dow wrote him with emotion and love and commitment and all of that, and that was written way back. It was not like that was the 40s with those books coming out. So even then, that was still considered. That would have been subversion at the time, right? Yeah, but it, you know, it was done, it was done very well, but mm -hmm. you can read all the books. Absolutely. But of course, Archie is, even though he's the legs, he's the henchman. You know, he's the sidekick. Uh, so, you know, I mean, Dr. Watson gets married. Uh, you know, there's, there's still that, the sacrosanct, you know, brilliant man who is. Although Nero had a female relationship in his past in one story, as I recall. And all those freaking orchids, you know, I mean, yeah. yeah. I know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, you don't have to get to George O'Keefe to see that. <laughs> well, interestingly, the, when Janice, you just made the joke, uh, time passes about the the sex scenes that don't happen on page. That's like in in the techniques of film noir. Back in the forties and fifties, you couldn't show, you couldn't even show the bedroom door closing. What you had, so there were so there were tropes, visual tropes, I guess, things like shutters banging open and shut, and <laughs> you know being blown, doors the, blown open by the or, wind. Or the glass, like that. <laughs> and that was that was a visual cue for the moviegoers to know, oh, they're sleeping with each other now. The train yeah. going through the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's you a know? famous I, I example of that, and I can't remember what the movie was, but he's kissing down her back and he just goes off screen and she's wearing you know the the shoulder cut dress and he just his head moves off screen and apparently they were not going to let them release that movie because that yeah. is the filthiest thing we've ever seen and they <laughs> asked the editor how could you do that how can you be so disgusting and he said I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, well, where did he go? Where did he go? And he said, I don't, maybe he left. Maybe he went off stage and had a drink. I don't know. <laughs> well, we've got time for questions. So, here first. For whatever reason, my protagonist, I don't think there was a woman. So she's just a little bit more intelligent and determined than the rest of the protagonists. So I've got a two-part question. One is, do you think you can tell when you've got a male author writing a female uh, protagonist? And secondly, it's a little bit the reverse of tradition, um, and perhaps as cheap as this part. Um, should one perhaps, if you're a male writing a female protagonist, just use your initials as an author? I mean, traditionally it's always done the other way. The, the, the female wants to hide the fact that she's female and as the author and wants to get away as perhaps a male. So in, in my case, because I've got my time to cross to um, relationship, um, So I'll answer the second question first. So the second question is, should a writer I think your question is, should the writer disguise their gender? Across to like a male author, so that people say, well, this is... So should an author, a writer, disguise their gender if their protagonist is the opposite gender of themselves? So let me tell you why I use initials. I use initials because uh, Wong is my maiden name. I, my married name starts with the letter G. My first name is Sandra. I wanted to publish using my maiden name to honor my father, who's passed away. Um, and God bless him, he wanted me to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loved me, but he didn't really know me. Um, that's why I chose initials. And I haven't been Sandra Wong in almost 17 years. That's how long I've been married. So uh, it didn't feel right to me to publish as Sandra Wong at all. 
So that's, that's why. So in terms of using initials, that's really a personal choice. I, and it, I'm not saying that as a cop-out. It's totally, a, if you're comfortable putting your name out there, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Ken. Ken, if you're comfortable publishing as Ken, and, and you are going to stand behind your female protagonist or your female lead, then do that. If, if you like the mystery, pun intended, of publishing under your initials, then, then do that. I really do believe it's a personal choice. So that was the second question. I don't question. think you'd be behind uh, an eight ball doing it. Uh, I, I think people accept you know, uh, characters from pretty well anybody anymore. There's really good examples of, uh, you know, I mean, oh, uh, Steve, Steve Larson uh, writing The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or J.K. Rowling writing uh, whatever his name is in um, The Cuckoo's Calling. Uh, no, no, no. no. She writes as Robert. Yeah. She writes as Robert what's, Galbraith what's now. What's the name of the detective with the one leg? Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, you know, there's there's very good examples of either or. I mean, P.D. James. Uh, everybody knows uh, she's a woman. I mean, she never. It, it's not like writing as Currer Bell or anything like that. They, uh, she comes. There's a picture of her on the back of the book from the very beginning. She originally chose PDJ because she, she, she wanted to hide the fact that she was a woman, because that's what I understood. But she right I mean, no, I know, I know. yeah, but an unsuitable job for a woman comes out very, very shortly, and all of the books have her picture on the back. Interesting. I'm sorry to... But <laughs> I bumped into... Uh, I was talking to a, a writer, a crime writer, and she says she's going to uh, use uh, just her initials She's going to write her next crime novel because, and she says, well, as a man, of course, you would read some uh, crime novel written by a woman. So there's still this impression well, yeah. 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 Okay. that there are certain people who would read a crime novel because it's a woman. So this it does continue to happen, I guess. You know, Ken, can, can the, I, can can I, you, I, might, you might want to ask an editor. Can I, can I jump into that with Ken? Um, the name you use um, while you're writing your book is the least thing you should worry about. <laughs> whether, whether you want to apply, that, don't even worry about that until you get a deal and you're going to figure out how you're going to promote it. And, and the, other, <laughs> the other thing, um, your other question is about uh, a man writing mm -hmm. from a pe female perspective, whether that can work. If you have the skill, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, all power yeah. to you. And like, like I always tell back. people, because this comes up all the time, you know, genders and writing genders. And, I, you know, I keep saying, well... <laughs> They're people, right? I mean, you got a couple parts different. People ask me about those homosexual characters, and was it hard for me to write homosexual characters? And I said, well, <laughs> they're thugs. They're just <laughs> dudes. I said, honestly, it's me and my wife, and I just, you know, lengthened some things and <laughs> made her seven feet tall and covered with Nazi tattoos. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, now I know which culture. one you are. I mean, if you want to write a native character, you've done your research, and you do an excellent job, all power to you. Write whatever works for you, and don't worry about how people are going to react to it, that comes later. I mean, just do what works for you. Use the name you want to use, and then if your editor says, oh, maybe we should use KJ, whatever, if you want to fight for it, fight for it. If you don't, it may be not a battle you want to worry about, because, you know, hey, you got a publishing deal. Absolutely. As long as the check's in your name. Yes, first here and then there, okay? Um, I think probably all of you know who we're, and probably everybody in this room, um, the early authors who were writing female PIs were running into a situation that the fan base for PI novels was mostly male and pushing back against the idea of women being PIs. And so a lot of the early ones seem to have been uh, really kick-ass kinds of PIs, like, like Warshawski by Sarah Gretzky. Um, and you guys talked a little bit about your characters, but we're some distance from that. But to what extent are they similar to those early PIs and kicking ass? And to what extent might they <laughs> Well, I would say, I would say that VI is probably, VI Warshawski by Sarah Peretsky is probably a better uh, 
first female PI than Kinsey Milhone. And Sandra and I have had this discussion in the past, but my concept of Kinsey Milhone is that she is a guy with a little black dress in the back of her Volkswagen. She, there is nothing female about Kinsey Milhone. So I, I just saw that as a shtick, you know. Uh, whereas Sarah Paresky really took uh, the genre and did the twist and said, okay, so what if you have somebody who is very devoted to her mother and who has issues of having to live alone and who, who feels as if her neighbor is trying to adopt her the way some single women feel as if they get encroached on. And, and she was dealing with issues that were very female-oriented issues that a Sam Spade and a... Travis McGee would never have to deal with. So yes, she was expanding and doing something interesting. And I think, uh, um, let's see, who else would I put in there? Uh, Kate Fanzler was a very interesting kind of female detective. Um, oh, Cordelia Gray interesting in a in a slightly different way like she played the the idea of what do you do if you throw the knife in there you know but uh, uh, yeah there it's it was an amazing uh, burst of action for sure uh, Sam Adams uh, Samantha Adams was uh, really good and Tess Gerritsen and um, oh Okay, well, we just got the high sign, oh, did so we, we just should get, oh, we did get we? to so, that sorry. last question. And we have another question, so oh, sorry. I just had a funny story to add Ken's comment. Um, my daughter recently just got her cheese having her poems published. Um, my daughter's 17, so she's been published before I am. So I'm quite proud of her. Um, but she, the first thing she said to me, because she had a sign of her niece, the first thing she said to me, she says, Mom, don't send them in and I said, okay, well, they don't ask me to bring you, but all right. She said, oh, thank God. She says, I don't want the paparazzi following me all over. <laughs> <laughs> now, my daughter is high functioning autism, so this was a, a really great milestone for her that uh, she is with the Young Writers of Canada uh, competition, and she was one of the finalists. Oh, well, fantastic. That's it great. is a valid concern, though. I mean, especially. In today's world with social media, I, you know, it's tragic, and I, I hate to have to say that I've seen it so much, but I have so many female writer friends that get just, you know, creeped on all the time by random dudes on Facebook that probably don't read <laughs> and really don't know who they are, but they're sending them just the most atrocious messages and propositions. And it's like, you know, and these are married women with children that have, you know, they're not putting anything out there to be asking for that, you know, as mm -hmm. they say, but, you know, it just seems to come out of the woodwork as soon as they see a female who is in the public eye and it's... Yet another quickly. gender issue. I was going to say, quickly, exactly. I want to say something quickly. The, the, if the sci-fi and fantasy writing community is going through a huge situation now about um, female writers, uh, gender things, how to, act at, how to act, at, act at conventions, sexual harassment, all these things, it's, it's, it's interesting and very frightening to watch because um, you know sci-fi fantasy has been seen by, as a male dominated thing and women have to do it but they're going through a huge huge issue of the old boys network pushing back saying no we want pictures of uh, of, uh, of female warriors with their yep. breasts chain and, uh, male bikinis and the women going, that's not a, that doesn't work so it's it's very it's very troubling to see that but it's also very troubling to see the majority of sci-fi fantasy writers pushing back against the old boys network saying we're changing you guys keep up with us or you're screwed and it's interesting that you say that because those female writer friends that i'm talking about most of them are either fantasy or yeah. horror writers i don't know a single crime writer and this is nothing against the, the physical attractiveness of you ladies. <laughs> but I don't know a it's single okay. crime or mystery writer that's been 
harassed. you know, harassed that way, the same Online. way that these horror and fantasy authors are. Because we know all those poisons. Absolutely. Yeah. And we know where to hide the I bodies. Hope that's what it is. <laughs> So uh, it looks like it. we are out of yes. time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.